Welcome to Tanya in Real Life. And today we're going to be learning Tanya Perak Hey. Before we start, I just wanted to share um, a little bit, a thought that's going to lead us into, into the topic. So I was working on a project with someone and she told me about a friend of hers who had a teenage son who had, it was a terrible, terrible story. Um, and I'm not saying it for the terrible part of it. I'm telling it for the way that the person in the story was dealing with it. So their son, this person's friend, lost her son in a very tragic, actually, murder um, by a fellow teenager. And it was a whole story, and th there was a battle in court because the parents of the person who murdered his friend were trying to get him out of prison. And it was a very intense court battle. And the mother of this boy, the mother, the bereaved mother, the mother who was experiencing tremendous pain and grief over the brutal murder of her son, said, whatever happens in the court, happens in the court. For me, my peace and my comfort is a whole different story. And my comfort comes from doing good deeds in honor in honor of my son. And, and so she was able to face every day with a sense of peace and not with an urgency to hurt back and to hurt anyone else. Where does she get the strength to do that? It's unbelievable if you think about it, you know, to really face every day with peace and with a sense of focus on doing good deeds in honor of her son and being comforted by that, taking strength from that, as opposed to having a deep, unsettled urgency to hurt the people who hurt him. And that's just a very extreme example. But on another, uh, a more simple example, I was talking to my mother recently and she had to make a phone call that was super difficult for her to make. It's something that her husband, my father, used to take care of for her. And um, it was very difficult to do. So she told me that the way she does this is she takes out her to Helen the way she does something difficult, let's say she has to make a difficult phone call, is she take out her Tehillim, she'll say a capital Tehillim, and that and that gives her all the strength and the courage she needs, and then she can go ahead and do what she needs to do. So these are just two very simple recent examples that I heard of where somebody could tap into something very deep, very real, very personal. It's inside of ourselves, and we can access this, and with that you know, meet our challenges with dignity, with courage, and, and with a sense of peace. So how do we get there? And I think that's the bigger subject of what we're, what we're talking about. And I would like to just put it in context, because last week we did some, we kind of took a break, diverted from the general subject. So let's just put it in context of where we're up to, okay? We come to the Balatanya with a pile of emotional, or challenging situations. We come with insecurity, with weakness, with trauma, anxiety, OCD, um, difficult relationships, difficult toxicity. Um, and our question is, what is the terrorist prescription for all of this? How do we find direction and guidance moving forward? So first we learned that we're not gonna be labeling ourselves by anything external. We're not taking on a value system that doesn't belong to us, that's imposed on by society. We are going to value self, ourselves for who we are, and we're going to look at ourselves from the inside out. And then all that messy stuff on the table, that whole pile of challenges to our emotional wellness, it's all rooted in the way we're wired. It's something we have to deal with, and we're going to deal with it. We're capable of dealing, it, dealing with it effectively, but first, we need to be empowered. First, we need to hold on to that wealth of energy that's going to give us everything we need to be able to navigate the challenges of our lives, the internal channel challenges, the external challenges, meaning the challenges of our own emotional struggles and the challenges of the difficulties that we encounter or the unpleasantness that we encounter in our lives from outside of ourselves, whether it's other people or situations, circumstances. So... Here's the thing, and, and it's interesting, I never realized it in this way until I was you know, thinking about today's Perak Hey and trying to understand how it fits in. Um, Hashem gives each of us immense inner wealth. 
And we cannot do without it. We cannot live without it. He gives us, what's that inner wealth that he gives us? He gives us an actual part of himself. There's no greater wealth in this world. There's no greater preciousness, spiritual pre preciousness than, um, than Hashem himself, right? Now we are his beloved children. Each of us is Hashem's beloved, precious only child. And that's the core, that's the essence of who we are. Our value is unchangeable. Our worthiness is untouchable. Our dignity is untouchable. And no matter what else is true about us, we are perfectly, absolutely respectable, no matter what. And this is really what our inner wealth is about. It's Hashem himself. It's eternal, limitless, infinite value. Now, what does it look like in, in real time? You see, I'm calling it, why am I calling it inner wealth? Um, why am I calling it inner wealth? I keep talking about you know, our neshama as inner wealth. I'm calling it inner wealth because really there's no nothing more precious in the world, right? Hashem is the overwhelming, the overarching value, the, the ultimate goodness, the ultimate value. And his presence within us is our personal spiritual wealth. It's what makes us spiritually rich. Um, and it's our birthright. Everybody has it. And I'm calling it wealth as opposed to just another detail about who we are. It's be the reason why I'm calling it wealth is because just like financial wealth is the doorway to an abundance of things, right? Things that provide us with comfort and pleasure. Spiritual wealth is the doorway to an abundance of emotion. It's the doorway to an abundance of joy and energy. Right. So financial wealth gives us access to comforts and pleasures and things. And spiritual wealth gives us access to emotions, energy and joy. So and to be more specific, it's like when you want financial wealth, how do you access it? You take out your card whenever you want to buy something nice for yourself. You take out that bank card, swipe the card and you could acquire whatever it is that we want to buy. And spiritual wealth in the same way means that whenever we want to generate emotions that elevate us, that recharge us, that energize us, that uplift us, all we have to do is pull out our card. We can tap into our inner wealth and acquire whatever it is, what we want in the way of emotional goodness. And, and that's our emotional wealth. Now, I'm called another one of the one of the main expressions of this emotional wealth of the of the spiritual wealth that we have is that is the fact that it's our identity and and worthiness. OK, now, the, the, the big challenge in all of this is that we live in a world where Hashem is hidden. Right. And on the outside of his hiddenness, there's a whole alternate reality. And on top of that, we also have a Yetzirah, which is an internal force of distraction and delusion. Now we call the Yetzirah evil. What does evil mean in the in the Baal Tanya's book? Evil is not a monster, not a murderer, not a ganiv, not a low life, right? Evil means a force that obstructs Hashem's truth. It's something that obstructs Hashem's truth or distracts us from Hashem's truth. It conceals Hashem's truth from us. Our Yetzirah is an internal drive that pulls us away from our awareness of Hashem. It obstructs our awareness and um, of Hashem and of our neshama. And as a result, we're not naturally conscious of our true identity. We're not natural, naturally conscious of our inner spiritual wealth, the wealth that translates into emotional wealth. And we know that we really need that consciousness very urgently because no person could face life's challenges without having an internal reservoir of strength and courage and worthiness and an anchor of peace and sanity um, within our own selves, right? Nobody can face challenges with a sense of peace without having where to draw that peace from. So remember the story of that, we talked about this, I don't remember when, but for sure, we did it more than once. Remember that story of the millionaire or the multi-billionaire who didn't know that he's a billionaire? He didn't know about the money in the bank, right? And we talked about, is he rich or is he actually poor? So we said he's rich, but without being aware of the money in the bank, 
he will never use it. He'll never benefit from it. He can't benefit from something that he doesn't know about. So spiritual wealth is the currency of value that we're going to be tapping into. We all have it just by virtue of having part of Hashem within us. We're spiritually rich beyond measure. But we don't want to be a millionaire who doesn't want to ben- who doesn't have any benefit from his wealth. We want to benefit from our spiritual wealth. We want that spiritual wealth to translate into dollars or or to be more to, 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 to apply it to the analogy we're talking about. We want the spiritual wealth to translate into emotional wealth, to courage, to dignity, to worthiness, to peace, to clarity, to all the goodness that we want. And we cannot engage in our lives successfully without having this spiritual wealth and without being able to activate it and let it flow into our lives. So our goal then is how do we let our neshama flood our consciousness? Because when our neshama floods our consciousness, we're aware of our inner wealth and we're empowered to experience it in action. And that's what we talked about. That was all, you know, Parag Bayes was about the inner wealth, our neshama. And then Paragimel, we talked about how do we activate our neshama? How do we actually become aware of it? How do we let it flood our consciousness, right? And we said that that is about thinking about Hashem. Thinking about Hashem generates emotions about Hashem. Um, we, We can learn about Hashem, talk about Hashem, and think about Hashem in a way that's very personal and applying, making it relevant to our lives. But thoughts and emotions only take place in our in ourselves and we want a connection on a deeper level we want to charge up our neshama just like an electronic appliance gets charged up when it's plugged into its source of power to a live electricity to a live source of electricity we can charge up our experience or our consciousness of our neshama by plugging into our ultimate source and that is engaging in a relationship with hashem And the entry point to doing that, the entry point to gaining, to entering a relationship with Hashem, to engaging in a relationship with Hashem is Taira and Mitzvahs. Now let's remember, I just want to point this out because I know it was mentioned before, but let's just say it again. There's a distinction between being connected with Hashem and experiencing that connection. Nothing can stop us from being connected. But the only way we can experience it is number one, by thinking about Hashem, number two, doing Mitzvahs. Okay. Every time we do a mitzvah, our neshama is being expressed in action. And with that expression comes strength, just like a muscle gets strengthened by doing exercise, by using it without using it, it, it dries up, it shrivels, it weakens, right? So too, every time we do a mitzvah, our neshama's influence, the muscle here is our consciousness. It's our consciousness of our neshama. It's our consciousness of our connection with Hashem and Hashem's light completely envelops us and embraces us like a hug from our heads to our feet. Now in Parakeh, that was all, that was Gimel and then Dalit. Now in Parakeh, we're going to take this one step further. There's one mitzvah that gives us even more than Hashem's light wrapping around us in a wondrous embrace. It's a mitzvah, but it's something even more and it's a sub something in itself. It's something that we ingest. It nourishes our neshama and makes us more open to consciously experiencing our connection with Hashem. And this one very special mitzvah that's incomparable to any other is learning Torah. On a side note, I know that when I've taught this in the past, um, when we've discussed this in the past, a lot of women say, but women don't have a mitzvah of learning Torah. So maybe we don't have an obligation to learn Torah because um, men have an obligation to learn Torah, but women are exempt from mitzvahs that depend, that are time sensitive. And learning Torah is one of those mitzvahs that are time sensitive. Um, And so we don't have the mitzvah, the obligation to, but when we engage in learning Torah, we have the same spiritual impact. So it applies to all of us and to each of us as well. Now, in the previous Perek, the Baal Tanya quoted the words from the intro to Tikkune in Tikkune Zaihar. Eliyahu Navi said about Hashem, Lace machshavat visabach. No thought can grasp you. Our minds are not capable of understanding Hashem. But as we said in Perek Gimel, through Tyra Mitzvah, even though we cannot understand Hashem, 
we do through Torah mitzvahs, we do actively, consciously experience a bond with Hashem. And we do, our minds do grasp Hashem. So in order to understand and appreciate more what this bond looks like, specifically learning Torah, the Baalat Tanya now is going to explore this concept of tefisa, um, grasping. Because Eliyahu Hanavi said, no thought can grasp you. Lace machshava tefisa bach. What is the word grasp or hold coming to teach us? Eliyahu could have used the word know or understand, right? A lot of times people, when they're trying to explain something, they'll say, do you get it? Right? Why? Not? What do you mean you get it? It's not, is it, is, it's an abstract idea. What do we mean when we say this is something that we can hold and actually get? Um, the owner of it could have said, nobody could understand you. Nobody could comprehend you. Nobody could think about you. Such, you know, such kind of words. But no, the, the, the um, Eliyahu and Abi used the word grasp. And the reason why the Baal tells us is to teach us that when we know something in our minds, what we're doing is not just understanding it, we're holding it. We grasp it. We contain it. We're getting it as if it's something physical that we can hold. It becomes part of us on a very deep level. It takes up space, physical space in our consciousness. It changes us. It becomes part of the lens through which we view ourselves and other people and the world. So the text of Parakeh is very short. I'm going to, let's jump in and um, learn a few lines. Oh no, whoops, sorry. I should have opened this before. Okay. I'm going to just read a few lines inside. For additional explanation, let's give a, a better explanation, a more deeper explanation to the words, um, tfisa, to the word that means grasp. No thought can grasp you. Any intellect, any mind, when we are per perceiving and understanding with our intellect some an idea or a bit of information or intellectual concept, okay, what is happening at that point? Our intellect is grasping, it's holding, it's grabbing onto that intelligence, that piece of wisdom, that idea, that concept. And it surrounds it. And the concept is encircled, it's enwrapped, it's contained within the intellect. Within the intellect that understood it and, and, and comprehended it. Okay, and another thing that's happening is um, they're kind of very enmeshed, if I could use the word, right? Um, the idea is being enwrapped and encircled by the mind, and the mind is also wrapped up within the idea. You know, we say sometimes it's the expression, I can't wrap my, he my head around this, you know? We're trying to wrap our heads around an idea, but in the process of while we're trying to wrap our heads around an idea, that idea is wrapping us. It's kind of holding us. Um, it's, 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 it, we are, our minds are also contained with it, within that idea. Um, so when, when a mind thinks about and understands any idea, two things are happening, okay? Number one, the mind grasps the idea and encompasses it, right? The idea is held within the mind. And number two, while we're learning an idea, our minds are absorbed within that idea. And this is only while we're actually learning it. When we stop learning it, it just stays within us. But while we're grappling with it, while we're trying to understand it, while we're exploring it or reading it or thinking about it, our minds are absorbed within that idea. And that idea is wrapping itself around us. So there's a double bond. The idea gets absorbed within our minds. And plus, while we're learning, our mind is absorbed within that idea. Now. Here is something that is unique to Tyra, and, and, and um, this is a, an astounding insight that the Baal Tanya gives us. 
Um, you see, with all forms of information, the knowledge is always an abstract idea. Okay. For example, and let's say I'm studying math. Okay. Numbers. When I'm thinking about numbers, what's going on in my mind? I'm, I'm, I don't have the actual numbers in my mind, although I might have the pictures of the numbers dancing around, right? If I'm thinking about astrology, I don't have the sun and the moon and the stars in my head. I have my understanding of the sun, moon, and stars in my head. Do you, do you hear the difference? It's not the sun and the moon and the stars that's in my head. It's an idea about the sun and the moon and the stars. If I'm learning about i don't know if i'm learning about science i don't have the you know the scientific formula is not happening inside my head and an idea of it is being developed inside my head by contrast and this is the unique quality of tyra tyra is never just information tyra is hashem's thought it's hashem's thought hashem's wisdom and tyra and hashem are inseparable so when we learn Tyra, just the fact that we're learning Tyra, we're thinking about Tyra, we are, it's not just an idea about the Tyra, it's Hashem himself that is actually in our minds. Do you hear this? Because the sun, let's say I'm studying, I'm, I'm learning about astrology and I'm, I'm learning about the moon, right? The moon is not in my head. An idea about the moon is in my head. But the ideas in Tyra are not separable from Hashem. So when an idea of Tyra, and a thought about Hashem, rooted in Tyra, or any halacha, and the Baal Tanya gives an example of a halacha from Cheshen Mishpat, which he says, something that may not even ever happen in practical terms. It's not, we're not talking about spiritual karbanas and serving Hashem with song and with that. No, practical day-to-day -day halacha, the fact that we're studying it and we're thinking about it. Yeah, the ox is not in our head, but right, we're, we're learning about a halacha regarding an ox. The ox is not in my mind, but Hashem is in my mind. Just because Hashem and Torah are inseparable. And this is, this oneness, this unity does not exist in any other form in our lives. Knowledge is the deepest form of bonding. When you know something, you cannot unknow it. You become one with it. It changes the way you see the world. It becomes part of your schema of knowledge and, and awareness, right? You can't unknow something, you're already changed by it. Everything else was shifted around to make room for this knowledge. And within this deepest form of bonding, within the, the bonding that we call, you know, that, that happens through knowledge, there is nothing like the bond of Hashem, with Hashem that we achieve through learning Torah. Because for all people, our essence is way bigger than any of our thoughts. Let, let me give you an example, okay? You know, Many of you know, I, Baruch Hashem, I, I wrote a book. I mean, it came out of my computer. I feel like I didn't write it, but it came from a, as a gift. But, you know, in a certain sense, my book is, is a window into my soul. But actually, it's not my soul. It's a book. It reflects my soul. It reflects my deeper self. But it's not me. It's just a book. It's separate from me. And, and, and somebody could have, you know, someone once told me, Oh, I hear your voice playing in my head. I'm like, and I don't know that person. She hears my voice because she's reading the book. Now, that is a one-way relationship because I'm a human being. I am not bigger than myself. I'm just me, right? Obviously, we're all connected on a soul level, but I'm talking about on a conscious experience level, the fact that she has my, my voice in her head it's not because I'm talking to her right now. It's because she has, it's, it's coming from within her and it stays within her and it's limited to within her. By contrast, if you learn Hashem's book, we learn Hashem's book that he authored. As we're hearing his voice, he is talking to us. It's active, alive, organic. That bond is happening in real time. And there's no other unity, there's no other closeness 
um, that that is comparable in any other place in the physical world because this is a very deeply spiritual reality. It is a reality that could only exist in in Hashem's um, in Hashem's reality in Hashem's in Hashem, with Hashem because Hashem is limitless. All of us are limited to our own space, to our own minds, to our own selves. But when we learn Hashem's book, Hashem is talking to us. Hashem is engaging within us, and we have Hashem. It's not just it's not just we think we have Hashem's voice in our minds. No, Hashem is in our minds. Hashem is actively within us in that in that time. So the unity we can achieve when we learn Torah is incomparable to anything else. And the Baal Tanya's very exquisite words, he says, "Vehu yichud nifla." This is a wondrous unity. She'ein yichud kamayhu. I put this in the notes. Um, this is a wondrous unity. There is nothing like it, nothing even comparable to it at all. Nothing comes close to this kind of unity in our physical lives. To literally be together and unified from every angle, including every corner, from every aspect, we are one with Hashem when we learn Torah. What makes this unity so unique? Hashem is one in a way that nothing else in the world is. Hashem's connection with Torah is a unity that does not exist elsewhere. And that's why Torah learning makes our bond with Hashem extremely and uniquely powerful. Just to put it in context of what we did in general with mitzvahs, through mitzvahs, Hashem's light completely surrounds us. And with Torah knowledge, in addition to Hashem's light surrounding us, Hashem's wisdom is also within us. Now, does this apply only to someone who knows a lot of Torah? The Baal Tanya says, no, this applies to everyone and anyone. Even if somebody is learning Aleph phase, he doesn't say if someone's learning Aleph phase, but he says each person on their level, on their understanding, if somebody is learning Aleph phase, that's where they're up to in learning Torah, that this experience belongs to them in that time and in that space. So no matter what you're learning in Torah, no matter what your level of understanding is, each of us experiences a very unique bond with Hashem just by learning Torah. And for this reason, the Baal Tanya says, Torah is called food for our neshama, literally nutrition. Nutrition. Um, for our neshama, just like physical food nourishes the body, it becomes part of our flesh and blood. We eat something, it becomes part of you. When you learn something, it becomes part of your emotional, psychological makeup. And Taira, because it's Hashem's wisdom and because it's Hashem himself, when we learn Taira, Hashem himself is now, it's like ingesting Hashem. We, Hashem himself is now, his light is manifest and flooding our consciousness and our subconscious. So the Torah is a life-giving force. We get life from the life of life, right? Through Torah. Now, there's two conditions for this impact. The Baal Tanya doesn't say it as conditions, but he's saying it. Um, and I put the words here. Number one is we have to take in the learning. Later on, we'll say what happens when you just say the words of Torah, okay? Right now, we're not talking about what happens when you say the words of Torah. We're talking about what happens when you're actually investing your mind. You're concentrating, you're thinking, you're, you're being present with those where you're grappling, you're trying to wrap your mind around it, okay? What happens it? Um, what ha that's one of the conditions. In the words of the Baal Tanya, kach so it is with the knowledge of Torah and its understanding within the heart of the person who's learning, he's trying to learn it well and understand it well with his mind. Ad specifically until he kind until he's like struggling, reaching, striving, expanding his mind, opening his mind to grab hold of this idea. And that's how he becomes one with it and it becomes one with him. 
With that, it becomes food for his soul and a life force within him. It's unbelievable words. The Torah learning becomes food for our soul and a life force within him. From what life force? From what life? From the life of all life, Hashem's infinite life. And it becomes enclosed with our, with, within our own selves. Okay, so that's the first thing. We need to actually reach for it. We need to, we need to be using our minds to be able to ingest, ingest the words of the Torah. And number two is um, we want to make the learning intentional. We want to make the learning, somebody who uses Torah, to advance their own knowledge or to become, uh, to get a degree, to become a Talmud Chacham, that's a whole different story. Here, what we want to try, the Baal doesn't say it as a condition. The Baal kind of just mentions it, you know, we're talking about Torah Lishma, and he says, what does Lishma mean? With an intention, with an awareness, I right now, I want to bond my soul with Hashem, the kasher nafshe la Hashem, al yidei hasagas atayra ish kafi sechon. So that's the second thing. Now, by the way, whenever these conditions are met, even later, the impact takes effect. So if I didn't learn the Shema, but then tomorrow I did, I kind of open the the I un I release all that was previously learned into the floodgates of this impact. Um, okay. One more very meaningful idea that the Baal Tanya teaches us here is this. You see, we learned that mitzvahs are like clothing for neshama, right? Mitzvahs are clothing. It's Hashem's enveloping us in a hug. And Torah is like food. Now, physically, we know that every person needs both food and clothing. So from that perspective, you know, we, it wouldn't be that Torah is, has a, a greater quality than, than, than mitzvahs. It would just be, you need food and you need clothing. You need Torah and you need mitzvahs. But there's something about Torah that is above even every other mitzvah. Because in addition to being like food, it's also like clothing. When we are learning Torah, our mind is also dressed in those ideas. And then here's my favorite line in this parak. The Baal Tanya says, V'chol shekein kishem b'fiv b'dibor. Especially, forget about learning. <laughs> Not just learning, but even more so when we verbalize the words of Torah. What happens when we verbalize the words of Torah? When we do this, the breath of our speech becomes an encompassing light. Do you hear this? The breath of our speech. Becomes a uh, encompassing light. It literally invites Hashem's light to surround us, embrace us, and protect us. And this is something each of us can do. My father, Baruch Hashem, was able to memorize most of the Tanya by heart and Mishnayis by heart. And whenever he would walk on the street, he would always be saying um, the words of the Tanya. But I want to wrap this up with something um, that is a little bit, it connect, it's going to pull it all together. Um, and it's a, also a story, about, it's a story about my father, that happened with my father. My son, one of my sons, was going to school in Crown Heights, and we live in Kensington in Borough Park. Um, and he would go home with the Borough Park bus. At the time, there was a Borough Park bus. And um, from school on Friday, till the time of the bar park bus he had some time and he would always every friday he would go to his grandparents um and spend some time there my mother would give him challenge and she would you know be very happy to see him and and he was very happy to be there and one of the things he used to do every friday was um there's a concept in we do is called being maver sedra where the men sit down on erev shabbos and they review the parsha saying the words of the chumash of the Torah of that portion of that week. Um, one time when my son came, 
he was, he comes into my parents' house and he saw right away, my father had oral surgery that morning and he could not speak. Um, his mouth was numb and the parts of his mouth were numb and he was, he, it was difficult for him to get the words out. But so my son said, okay, we're not going to be Mavra Sedra today. No, my father said, no, 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 let's sit down and learn anyway. Let's do this anyway. They open up the Chumash and he starts saying the words of the Chumash. And for the first three words, he was like, he couldn't speak. It was like coming out a little bit slurred. But afterwards, he just spoke and the words just flowed as if he didn't have oral surgery that morning, as if the numbness was gone, as if everything was as regular. That went on for about 10, 15 minutes. And then the phone rang and my father picked up the phone and he starts talking and he couldn't speak. The words were not coming out. They, they were just like, the person couldn't understand what my father was trying to say. And he, and, he, and he finished the conversation. My son was like, what just happened? What just happened? A minute ago, he's talking fine. And now he's not. Now, as an adult, now he looks back and he says, you know, the preciousness of saying the words of Tyra made such a big, my father was not a tzaddik. He was not a tzaddik. He was a regular person. He was a person who lived the ideas of Tanya, but a regular person. Okay. But when he when he learned the Taira, when he was going to open the Chumash and say the words of um, Taira, he was aware that he is bonding with Hashem. He was aware that he's bonding with Hashem himself. And this awareness filled his heart and mind so completely, it literally anesthetized his physical pain. And he was able to speak. It, over, it, it, it was an override of the physical aspect of his body. And this is something I think that each of us in our own lives, you know, I don't think that I could ever attain that kind of profound awareness, a deep, deep, deep appreciation to, to have such a physical uh, um, impact, a physical response to valuing Hashem or to valuing, appreciating what's going on, to being in touch with the spiritual dimension of what we're, we're doing, right? But certainly, let's reach for it. I know that I'm going to try to reach for it more because we can. Awareness grows when we do the das, when we think about it, when we personalize it, and when we absorb it. So I feel the reason why I brought this up now at the end is because we just learned something that I think is really powerful, like that we have this um, we have this power, this ability to really, really, really in, become so united with Hashem and really bring our neshama to the forefront of our consciousness and give ourselves such, um, such a powerful gift. And I, I want to put this in the context of, of what we spoke about in the beginning. And this is a summary, really, of chapters two to five, right? Each of us has a source of spiritual wealth, our neshama that is precious beyond description or beyond any limitation. And now that we've learned parakeh, because this is the last parak where we are gonna be talking about our neshama, parak Bays, gimel, dalit, and hey, we just had four, um, four chapters describing our inner wealth. And the reason why I'm calling it inner wealth, because I feel like for me, this, um, this perspective, seeing it, Seeing my neshama as inner wealth makes it very practical, makes it, makes what I can do with it, makes its impact on me very clear. Um, he, here's what I mean. I love this analogy with be a, mil, a billionaire who doesn't know his wealth, right? So there are three, there are three keys, there are three steps to experiencing our spiritual wealth or to buy emotional wellness. Number one, what we learned in Paragimel Make your spiritual wealth, be aware of your spiritual wealth. Make your spiritual wealth relevant, accessible, and practical. And how do we do that? By learning about Hashem and thinking about Hashem's greatness in a very personal way. Doing this creates a consciousness of Hashem's value. No, my father did not have that impact. He did not have that experience when he was a child of seven and even when he was an adult of 47. 
he had that experience when he was in his when he was older you know and and that came from working on it from when he was very young and and each of us can we're, we're not starting when we're very young i didn't work on developing my das from when i'm very young but i know that every single day that i invest time thinking about hashem and personally personalizing that makes the impact when i when i press the button oh wow um hashem is here it has a deeper emotional impact on me than it did yesterday and each of us can reach for this and each of us we cannot live without the courage the dignity the worthiness the beauty the goodness the strength i i, I can't even think of enough words but all that emotional goodness that we get from 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 having that value, the the bridge that we need to cross is knowing that it's there. And we do that by doing the das, by thinking about Hashem, learning about Hashem in a way that makes it practical. And our comparison to the multi-billionaire, this part of it, thinking about Hashem, learning about Hashem, making it personal, this is becoming aware of the wealth and getting a bank card, okay? Then we have to do something else because having a bank card is not enough. You can have a bank card and a wish list, but you didn't do anything yet. You still didn't buy anything for yourself. You still didn't get yourself a beautiful space to live. You still you still didn't help anybody else. You still didn't you know make a donation. You still didn't um, give people what they need, right? So number two is we want to express it and activate it, activate the impact, and that we learned in Parak Alid doing mitzvahs. This initiates a hug from Hashem. It's like swiping the bank card. And today what we learned about is I think nurturing and recharging ourselves. We're going to, by learning Taira, we feed our neshama. And this is in the mushal, in the analogy of the person who's so wealthy. It's like, you know, it's one thing to have wealth, but then you want to invest in that wealth. You want to invest that wealth. You want to grow your wealth. You want to, you want to expand it. And we expand our spiritual wealth. We grow it by learning Torah because learning Torah actually is ingesting Hashem within us. And verbalizing the words of Torah, the words are, are the breath of our speech becomes an encompassing light. I, I there's, there's to me, I, I can't think of a more, I cannot think of a more uh, a beautiful analogy. I just want to conclude with a question um, because let's do a moment of das right here because it's a short parak and we're done. And before we take questions, let's, I want to ask you a question. If we could see spiritual energy, what would we see happening while we are sitting here discussing these ideas, learning parak hey in Tanya? If we could see spiritual energy. What would we see? I'm going to read some answers. Um, an ability to transcend the mundane and really feel, feel Hashem within my whole being. Everything becomes clear. And my decisions seem very sharp on priorities. Yes. Wow. I could very much relate to that. Someone said it brings, I, I have peace when I learned that. Are you talking about the tiny sparks that ignite in everything and connect in a certain energy and bond? Beautiful. I would see lights connecting everything in life. Wow. Malachim rushing around with light, spreading light. I love that question. I actually had the same question. And Baruch Shem, I had this a different time when we were learning time. I asked my father the question. He said, Tyra is Tyra. Anything that's rooted in Tyra is Tyra. It doesn't necessarily have to be a chumash. It could be this this discussion right now, right here, is Tyra. Now it's not, you know, it's a it's a discussion about Tyra, but it's Tyra, you know. So, so anything that you read, anything, a book that you read on your own, a class that's recorded, um, there is something like the Baal Tanya says: the actual words of the Tyra um, create the breath of our of the of our speech creates Hashem's life. So Hashem's light. So that would only apply to an actual safer that's that has the halacha of kedusha. You know what I, you know what I mean? Um, that would only apply to a specific to a safer like a chumash, a navi, a tanach, uh, um, a tanya, a gemara. We don't have the obligation, but we have the opportunity. 
And with the opportunity comes exactly the same impact. The spiritual dynamics, if you see what we just said, you know, what's happening spiritual, if we could turn the light on, on what's happening spiritually when a woman is mm -hmm. learning or what a man is learning, it would be exactly the same spiritual um, connection, spiritual awareness, spiritual, you know, the, the whole, this whole thing that we're talking about, that we're actually ingesting God and bonding with Hashem in a way that's incomparable to any other physical union, um, that would apply to anyone who's learning, a child, an adult, a brilliant scientist, uh, a limited, you know, a, a, a person who's even may, maybe mentally challenged, you know, it's, it applies to everybody equally. You mean because it's not it's about us. It's not about us. It's about the giver, not the taker. If a tzaddik who's surrendered to Hashem, um, and he's really battled to Hashem, mm -hmm. and his agenda is pure, um, every single safer, every single, you know, the Gemara, the Rishonim, the Acharonim, any halacha safer, it's all, it's all Tyra. And that's the mm -hmm. beauty of Tyra, that it all was given at Har Sinai, even though we got five books, we got every single, whatever, any future chidush um, in Tyra all was given to us at Har Sinai and has exactly the same spiritual value and spiritual impact. Then he <laughs> needs to learn this, <laughs> down to learn Tanya. I don't know how anybody today could, honestly, I don't know how a person could really be from without these tools and without this awareness. It's really hard. It's really, really hard. But the truth is that it's out there. And if somebody doesn't learn it in Tanya, they learn it somewhere else because the ideas of the Tanya are so, they're old already and they've been extrapolated and adapted. And so many people wrote their own sarin based on the Tanya. It's out there. So it's available, Baruch Hashem. And, and more and more people are appreciating the inner dimension. So that's the good news. It's interesting what you're saying because... Um, are, are you, I hope you're not being hard on yourself. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> we all have, a, we all have a drive to serve Hashem. We all have a will to serve Hashem. And it's just a matter of like being aware of it. So, you know, if I, if I'm a, it's a good thing to say, obviously, why do I want to help myself? Why do I want to, why do I care to engage with more strength? Why? right? Why? Ultimately, the reason is there. So how conscious of, are we of it? Um, you know, could we be more conscious of it? Do we get more quote unquote points? Do we do we add more dot, you know, add more bank for the buck? If you're doing it anyways, you may as well think about Hashem and, you know, be more aware for sure. But um, it's not, it's not like we didn't do it at all if we weren't conscious. Because deep inside, we all want to do what's right. We all want to, our neshama's light to shine forth. That's we want to do the right thing. We want to do the right thing. And, and the whole challenge with not being good enough and this deep angst and the stress that we have about not being good enough. Why? Why do we even care? Why do we even care? It's because we know we're good. <laughs> it's because we we have this neshama that's just. You know that that has a that has a flame that's like a flame that just wants more it wants to shine more let there be let there be light let there be more light let there be nothing but light you know it's just constantly striving pushing higher faster harder so that's 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 who we are that's we're never satisfied a Jewish soul wants to shine and is never satisfied with yesterday's um with yesterday's goodness we always want to do more and um, you find many, you know, if it's not directed in this way, it's going to be directed in another way. Every, every Jewish soul wants to shine. And sometimes our Yetzirah hijacks that desire and switches it around and, and, and uses it as our, uh, becomes a self-destructive force that we become depressed about it and we become anxious about it and we beat ourselves up about it. And instead of, you know, um, bringing us up, and allowing us to shine more, it actually, you know, gets us stuck 
in self-pity and misery and helplessness. But in essence, uh, a neshama is never satisfied. A neshama keeps, always wants to grow and be more, do more, shine more. We're very, very complex people. And every emotion is coming either from our neshama or it's coming from our nefesh of Bahamas or it's coming from our Yetzirah, right? So first of all, next week, we're going to learn about this a little bit more as we start learning about our human dimension, our animal self. But the clarifying, de the clarifying um, detail that helps us know where where it's coming from is to see where we're going towards, to see where it's pulling us. Anything that elevates us and recharges us and makes us shine more is coming from our Never Shall We Kiss, for sure. The, for me, the biggest uh, awareness that I had today, um, preparing for today was like, oh my gosh, it's emotional, spiritual wealth that our neshama equals spiritual wealth. And I, I you know, we always talk about having emotional wealth and how do you get emotional wealth and you have to have success and you have to have positive experiences and you have to have validation. And my wish is for everybody to have all of these things, but it's such a blessing to know, not but, and it's also such a blessing to know that each of us already is spiritually wealthy. We have an immense treasure chest that's filled with something so powerful it can't even be described in words. And that is our soul. Now, what is it going to look like in action? That's up to us. And the three steps of how we get to that is thinking about Hashem to make it value. I, I feel like I didn't make that connection with the story that I told about my father. I didn't like make that connection. You see, the, and, and with the stories in the beginning, for a person whose son was tragically murdered, none of us should ever have to know what that pain is. For her to be able to face a day with peace while in court, the murderer's parents are trying to get him out of jail, right? For her to be able to engage with them and with the people in her life in peace and get her comfort from within, deep within herself, is a blessing that no money in the world could buy. Nothing, no therapy could give us this. Right. For a person who is has is very afraid and very feels weak when she thinks about making a phone call. She feels weak. She's afraid. She's embarrassed. She doesn't she doesn't she doesn't want to do this. It's so uncomfortable for her to be able to dig deep within herself and find the courage and find the strength and even do it with dignity and 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 with confidence that is a blessing and a gift that no money could buy and and it's the same thing with this story that i shared about my father like for him to be able to actually experience something precious something a physical impact from saying the words of tyra it's a gift it's a it's such a blessing and each of us we all have this it all comes from having a soul, having an actual part of Hashem within us. It's an unbelievable treasure. And um, I really want, I would love for everybody, if you take one thing out of today, it's like, let's really make this real. Let's make it a goal to own, to consciously take ownership of this spiritual treasure and let it flood our consciousness and let reach for, like reach for it. Um, Tap into it for whatever you need, whether it's courage, whether it's security, whether it's calm, whether it's peace, whether it's clarity, whatever it is, we, we make it stronger by using it. And specifically in the three ways that the Baal Tanya taught us, one, thinking about Hashem, learning about Hashem and thinking about Hashem, two, doing a mitzvah, and three, learning Taira. We, we've had times where people didn't learn Taira, women in our group typically many times don't learn Torah, but they said, you know, just participating in this Tanya discussion for a period of six weeks, eight weeks, whatever it was, I don't remember how long we did it for. We did 16 chapters, so maybe we did it for longer than that. Um, it was like they said, you know, just, just showing up, not doing any of the homework, so to speak, it made a subtle but definite change. Like I, I, I experienced a shift inside of me. And that's nothing to do with me. It's because the words of Tyra themselves 
have a certain energy. There's food and it's nourishing. It's it's um, it gives us strength, and that would probably probably be the same, whatever Tyra or Torah class um, people participate in, you participate in. But specifically, there is something special when you're learning about Hashem and you're thinking about Hashem and about your neshama. That takes it up a notch. So, so let's go for it. Let's really try to make this inner wealth accessible. Um, and, and, and let's have cl clear, direct, open access. I believe that in today's world, it's so challenging. We cannot live without it. We really need it more than ever. And we're blessed to be able to be doing this. So thank you so much for being here. I keep saying this every week, but I really, really mean it. I would not be learning Tanya now <laughs> if not for this group. And I'm so grateful because it's literally invigorating my life. It's giving me so much energy and strength in a way that I never even realized I needed. So thank you so much.